Welcome, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name's Stan. I'm the lead pastor here, and I want to thank you for joining us today, for taking a few minutes out of what will be a very busy, 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 busy day for many of you uh, celebrating Christmas. Thanks for spending a few minutes with us today so that we can celebrate it together. But I want you to think about for just a minute, why do we celebrate Christmas? Think about it for more than just a second. Because we go into chaos. The whole world goes into chaos preparing to celebrate this day. Why? Why do we bother? Why do we have all the parties and our work events and our neighbor events and our church events and we spend money we don't have to buy stuff for people we probably don't even like sometimes and then we end up in debt? And Why do we do all this? Is there anybody here that today would say, I'm tired? I'm exhausted because of all the things I just talked about. Is, is my hand the only one up? Please, I see that hand. All right, all right, all right. Why do we do that to ourselves? Why do we celebrate Christmas at all? If you're a follower of Jesus today, you're ready to tell me, and maybe you've already typed it in the chat. I don't know. I'm not reading that right now. But you're saying, Jesus is the reason for the season. That's why we do that. That makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? All the things I just described that exhaust us and wear us out and make us go, <sighs> and Jesus is the reason for the season. But still, why? Who is this Jesus that is the reason for the season that we celebrate? And what makes him worth celebrating? What makes it worth disrupting the whole world for this one day. Now, we all love the image of baby Jesus in a manger, right? It's nice and cuddly, and uh, when people do dramas or live nativities, whoever's had the most recent baby, they get the gig, whether it's a boy or a girl, it doesn't matter, and, uh, and it's usually a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, but that's a whole nother sermon for a whole <laughs> nother day. We love that image. We embrace the Jesus who is a compassionate healer when People are sick, and we, we, we've got the Gospels that talked about him going and healing people, and some of you have seen Jesus heal you or others in your life, and we embrace that Jesus. We love the stories of him performing miracles. We marvel at his teaching because he has so much wisdom, and he actually can just ask a question that silences a room and, and that nobody can respond to because his teaching is so amazing. And all of this is great, and I would suggest to you that all of this does make Jesus worthy of celebrating. But I would suggest there's something that's a bit more, far more significant than all the things I just described. So let's go back to his birth, and then the few days and even a few months following his birth to investigate what it is about Jesus that causes the world to go into chaos, and we do all this stuff to ourselves. What is it about Jesus that, that does that. So it was a time of chaos that Jesus was born into. The Roman emperor, his name was Augustus, he insisted that there be a census taken, that we count all the people in the Roman Empire. And their motivation for that was he wanted to make sure he was getting all the taxes he could, and he was going to raise taxes even more and everything. Uh, so anyway, I, I, all the political jokes running through my mind, get away, get away, get away. Anyway, that, that was Augustus. And he created chaos because he said, I want everybody to go back to where you were born to take this census. I want you to go, I want it to be a homecoming. So people are going to have to travel. And travel wasn't easy as it is today. Well, maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it's very similar. Travel was costly. Travel wouldn't have even been safe. Mary and Joseph, you've heard those names before around Christmas time, they were a part of the people that were traveling. They were going back to their hometown so they could be counted, so they could pay taxes. And Mary was pregnant. Mary was very pregnant. There's not degrees of pregnancy. You're either pregnant or you're not. But she was ready to pop, okay? And this would not have been a great time to travel. In fact, in modern society, we don't let women travel when they're that pregnant, right? We don't let them get on planes, things like that. Well, Mary was having to travel. And by the way, who has experienced the fact that very pregnant people disrupt Christmas? 
Have you ever experienced that? Okay, I, just a side note here. Yesterday we experienced that. My daughter-in-law, Danny, and if you're watching, I love you and I'm praying for you right now. She's in hospital right now. And she's 36 weeks pregnant. And she's having some complications with uh, infection and things, things like that. And they're trying to get her stabilized and everything. Well, Danny and my son Grant were meant to be hosting Christmas. And we did Christmas yesterday. And, and I thought it was silly. Anyway, they were hosting. But they wanted to host. So anyway, so Thursday night, we do it Christmas Eve. That's the family thing. And, and so we pivoted Thursday night at about 8 or 9 o'clock. We decided, okay, we're doing Christmas we did Christmas yesterday in what was a construction zone the night before. And we reset the construction zone to be a room and everything. Anyway, very pregnant people create chaos at Christmas. That's the point there. <laughs> For Mary, this was no ordinary pregnancy. If you're familiar with the story, you know that an uh, angel had visited Mary. And Mary was a virgin. And the angel told her she was going to bear a son. This is what the angel said in Luke chapter 1. Don't be afraid, because Mary was afraid when she seen an angel. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. So fast forwarding into the chaos that Augustus had created and all the travel and everything, Jesus was born. Look at what else the angel said to Mary about Jesus when he was going to be born. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Look at some of those phrases, Son of the Most High. He would be the king that sits on David's throne. He would be the final king. Did you pick that part up? Because it says his reign, his kingdom will never end. Just after his birth, angels then went to shepherds, and we sang about that silent night earlier, and they said this in Luke chapter 10. The angel said this, don't be afraid. Everybody's afraid when an angel comes. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today. Good news of great joy. We love that part of this story, don't we? It's good news of great joy, and we should love that part of this story. But then it says the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born. That means a king has come. The world changed that day because God came to earth. He made his home among people. A king had been born and it was a king like no other king had ever been or ever will be. He reversed the order of what things happen with a king. Instead of demanding that his subjects lay down their lives for him, he laid down his life for them. And then he calls them to lay down their lives for other people, for their friends, and even their enemies. He reversed everything. And it says then, he will reign forever with love and grace and truth. Don't miss that part. In our modern day, our modern version of Jesus, we miss this king part. We sing the songs that have the word king in it. But think for just a moment about how we really think about Jesus. We think about him in all these other ways. The, the baby Jesus, the miracle worker Jesus, the great teacher Jesus, maybe the fire escape Jesus. And that's the Jesus that we cling to and go to when we're in trouble and all those things. Maybe Jesus is the leader of our club. We are fans of Jesus. We wear his t-shirts and crosses around our necks. He's our superhero that's able to get us out of trouble. He's our pinata that if we hit him with the prayer stick just right, the candy will fall out and we get whatever we want, right? You know why we're laughing? Because that's actually true. That's how we view Jesus far too often. Even when we seek forgiveness of sin, friends, hang on to this one. Because I'm big on this. I think we need to seek forgiveness of sin. But if we're not careful, we do that, and it's all about us. I remember many, many, many times going to door knocking. We used to do this thing called door knocking. And, we'd say, and people come to the door, and we'd say, do you know today if you died whether or not you would go to heaven? Right? Anybody ever have somebody knock on your door like that? Anybody knock on somebody's door and do that? Don't do it anymore, please. That's annoying, okay? And it's not going to win anybody over. But we do that. Because 
we want them to know they're going to die and we want them to go to heaven. That's the whole presentation of the gospel there. We don't talk about this king that they need to follow. We talk about Jesus being that fire escape. Now, while we may miss this, Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 tells us the story about another king who actually understood very well this bit that we often overlook and often miss, that Jesus was a king. It says this in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. Now, during the reign of King Herod, that's important for us to, to stop and realize. The Jews, Israel, already had a king. And now Jesus is being born, and he is going to be the king. Now, Herod was not born a Jew, but he was in a family who had converted to Judaism. And uh, he uh, was uh, in favor of the Jews. He was for the Jews. He was a brilliant architect. He was a great military leader, and he was ruthless. He believed in Judaism. He loved the temple. He even invested in the temple. He did the sacrifices and all of the rituals. He was a, a good Judaizer person or whatever. He practiced Judaism. That's it. Is that, is that good enough? Yep. Okay, that'll do. And, and then, so, so that's the setting. When Jesus is born, there's already a king. And it says this. After that, it said, about that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? So they arrived they came from Persia, Babylon, somewhere like that. They were advisors in other kingdoms. And these guys were ones that looked at the stars and studied the planets to see what divine messages might be coming. That's what their jobs were. They traveled to Jerusalem because in their studying of the stars, they figured out, hey, a king was born there and we want to go and see him or, or near there. And by this time, several months later, at least, maybe a year even, uh, they came looking for the new king in Jerusalem because that's where the king would be, right? If you're the king, you're going to be in the capital city unless you're in Hawaii on holiday. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> that was a political joke, but uh, you missed it anyway. That's okay. They said this, where is this newborn king of the Jews? So when that reached Herod, when that question reached Herod's ears, he was afraid. He got upset about it, and everybody was, was confused. He moved into action because he wanted to protect his leadership, his dynasty. And he decided that uh, he would call a meeting of all the leading priests and all the smart people that would understand that question, the answer to that question. So he's pulling all the smart people together, and he's saying, hey, you've heard about this. I've heard about this. The stars are talking about it. The stars in the sky are talking about it. And he said this to them. He asked them a question. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Look at the word he used there right in the middle. Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? Literally, that's where will the Christ be born? That's the Greek translation. Where is the Christ? Emphasize on the Christ. That's a title. Very often, we... Uh, use Christ as Jesus' last name, or we use it in, in other different ways. We use it in uh, replacing it. Jesus and Christ, they're synonymous. But Christ is actually a title that means anointed one. It means appointed one to be the king. That's what Christ was all about. See, Herod knew there was a coming Messiah. And the penny's dropping for him that this is the guy. This is the final king. And he didn't like it, but he knew it had to be taken seriously. That Jesus was coming, he was going to be the king. So the priests uh, and teachers answered him. They said, the prophets told us it's going to be in Bethlehem. He's about 10 k's from here. That's where he was born. So Herod then understood that. He called the wise men back to him, and he told them, hey, go find him. This is where he should be, and then come back and tell me so I can go worship him. We found out later that Herod actually wanted to kill him, and that's why he wanted him to come back, wanted them to come back, but uh, he said, go find him. Bring word back to me. He had a choice to make when he realized the Messiah had been born. He could accept the fact that there was going to be a new king, and he was born, and he's on the way, or he could reject him. 
He chose to reject him. He made the, the wrong choice because he didn't want to submit to that king. Herod killed all the baby boys under two years old because he wanted to make sure that he got Jesus in that. But as horrible as Herod was, he got something that you and I often miss. Harry got what we miss. He made the wrong choice in the end, but he believed that Jesus was the promised king. He had no doubt the king had been born. So why do we celebrate Christmas? Christmas marks the birth of the king. It was God in the flesh coming to us. And when a king shows up, people have a choice to make. They have to choose how they're going to respond to that king. We have to decide, is he the king? Is he my king? Or is Jesus something I've reduced to something, something far less? A baby, a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, someone I'm a fan of even, someone I've got a tattoo about or a cross uh, uh, or on a necklace. See, a conscience reliever. Is he the last resort when I'm in trouble? We want God to act on our behalf. We want God to fix things that are problems around us. We want God to fix those other people that are around us, right? We don't even fix us because there's nothing wrong with us, of course. But that's the Jesus that we're looking to. Some ask, when we look around the world today, why doesn't God just step in and intervene? Does anybody wonder that sometimes? My hand is way up when I look around. But I want to read to you something that C.S. Lewis said in a work that wasn't famously published. It was called The Case for Christianity. And he said this. He said, God will invade but I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. We want God to intervene. We think if we were God, the world would look very different. We would fix all the ills of the world, all the, the poverty, all the disease, and all the wars and all that. And we'd take out all the bad people and stuff. But if God intervened, it would be game over. C.S. Lewis saying God's going to invade. But when he does, it's going to be something that we're not expecting. He's going to come crashing in, C.S. Lewis says. Then he says, for this time, it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. He said, there's no use waiting and deciding then. It is too late. It will be the time when we discover the reality of which side we are on, C.S. Lewis said. But then he closed that, that statement with this. Now today, this moment, is our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. A king has come. We have to decide what we're going to do with that king. How do we respond to the king? Friends, history has proven that when people decide to follow that king, the world becomes a better place. All around the world, this is true. In our local community, it's true. I was visiting with a, a, a man that uh, we, we got the staff uh, f uh, some plants for uh, a Christmas gift this year. And I went uh, uh, to see this guy and have a chat with him uh, a couple of weeks ago. And we were talking and uh, he, he said, you know, if more people were like you guys, and he's talking about you guys, he's talking about the church, he said the world would be a better place. This guy's not yet a follower of Jesus. I'm praying for him. 
But he said, if more people were like you guys and did what you do, the world would be a better place. What he was recognizing is that there's a king that he doesn't know yet that we have chosen to follow. And when we follow him the way that he tells us to follow him, the world becomes a better place. Have you accepted the invitation to follow this king? Yeah. Notice the question. Have you accepted the invitation to follow? I'm not asking you just have you been forgiven and are you going to heaven when you die? I'm asking if you made the decision to follow and submit to the king. Not just believe. Herod believed. He was even religious and he invested in the temple. And if he was around today, I would suggest to you, Herod would actually go to church more than just Christmas and Easter. He was a very religious guy following the rituals of the day. Have you accepted the invitation to follow the king? Fans of the king believe. Followers submit. I'm gonna, Father, you saw those hands. And you see, more importantly, the hearts of everyone that's here. And Lord, as we close out this moment, I want to thank you for the stirring that you have done in some hearts this morning. And for those that acknowledge that they said that prayer. Lord, I pray for them right now that you would give them an understanding and you would give them confidence in this newfound faith. Help them to be ready to take the next steps. Lord, for those that didn't raise their hand, but maybe in their heart they said it because they said, I've been going to church all my life, but I've never given Jesus my life. I've never really submitted to the king. I've just been a fan. I want to be a follower. For those that their hearts were stirred in that way, Lord, I thank you for stirring them and Lord, help them cross that line of faith now. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us today. Thank you for sending Jesus to be our Savior, to be our healer, to be our comfort, to be peace in a world of chaos. But most of all, thank you for sending him to be our king that is worthy of following and celebrating and sending our world into chaos so that we can say, I'm a follower of the king in whose precious name we pray. Amen.